whenever someone asks if I'm related to Mark, I really stress through marriage. Um, (laughs) Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Psalm 25. We are continuing in our series, our summer series on the Psalms. We're going to take it to uh, two weeks into September as well. So we're almost done here, but uh, we are going to be encouraged by the word of God in the Psalms today. If you don't have a Bible, uh, please grab one that's sitting in front of you or turn yours on. If you're using a digital Bible and head on there, we don't put the script, scripture on the screen. I want you down in your words so you can be making sure I haven't changed anything on you uh, and that it is the word of God speaking to you. So with that, let's read through the psalm, and then we will start working our way through it. Psalm 25, verse 1 says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who will keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the ways that he should choose. His soul shall abide in the well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me, be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my afflictions and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with the vi- what violent hatred they'd hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of her troubles. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Well, Psalm 25, as I said, is the third last psalm in our series, and then we're going back into the fun letter to the Corinthians from Paul. We're going to go back into 1 Corinthians and and start to finish it off. Uh, But Psalm 25 contains a scenario that I think we have all faced, and that's the question on which path should I choose to take in my life? Which direction should I go? Which decision should I make? Which one is good? Which one? O Lord, are you in? Which one, O Lord, are you blessing? Which one are you not in? Which one are you not blessing? Which path is right? And all of us, I think I can say safely, have prayed that prayer before. We have felt the tension and the pressure of making the right choice in trying to discern God's will. Who has tried to discern God's will before? Yeah, all of us should be putting up our hands, unless you're a child, maybe you haven't yet. But it's things like this throughout our life. Which school should I go to? There are so many great options. Which one should I choose? Should I take this job that has been offered to me? Should I quit the job that I have that brings me so much financial security? Should I move to a different city, a different town? Should I go into missions and move to a different country and serve God there? Here's a big one. Should I marry her? Should I marry him? Are they the right person for me? God, would you just make your way clear to me? Like send a sign or something. All of us have been there. We didn't know what to choose, but so we asked God for help. And maybe some of you are in that tension right now. Maybe some of you are praying that prayer right now. God, I don't know what I am to do. Make your way clear. And this could be 
or maybe it has been when you're in that season, one of the main areas of stress in your life, making this decision. Now, if you're like me, it's really hard to choose between chocolate peanut butter ice cream and tiger tail ice cream. So I get hung up on all decisions. But, but for you, it might be a little bit bigger. When contemplating this tension this week as I was writing this sermon, it made me think of back to my childhood of those choose-your-own-adventure novels. Does anyone remember those choose-your-own-adventure novels? One of my favorites as a kid was, uh, you know, you'd be being chased by a flock of rabbit wolverines, and then an old lady in the forest would invite you in to to her house to help you escape. And if you were to accept her invitation, the book would say, turn to page 210. And then you'd go there. And if you said, no, I don't want to do that, she's crazy, you go to page 130. Me, being the cordial person I am, I accept it because I don't want to be rude. I was taught better. Turns out she was a witch, okay? She she put a spell on me. She cooked me and ate me, okay? And, And that was the end of the story. I know more, but the kids aren't downstairs yet. I'm sorry. I was trying to hold off. Uh, (laughs) But that's how we view the will of God. We often view the will of God this way, that we have two doors ahead of us, and we have to get that right door. If we choose the right door, it's going to lead to prosperity. It's going to lead to blessing and peace from God. And if you choose the other one, it's going to just lead to destruction. And we say things like, if only I knew what the doors contained. Eventually, when I got older, reading those novels, I would get wise, and I would go, okay, I'm just going to skip to the last page, read the most happy ending, and then retro work backwards, and, and never know surprises. I know how to go. And I'm sure that tells us all something very disturbing about my personality, but, but we'll explore that in years to come. But wouldn't it be great if we could do that in life? Just flip to the last chapter read the most happy ending that is laid out for us, and then we just work it backwards and choose all the right paths to go. There'd be no more surprises for us, nothing catching us off guard. And what this boils down to, that longing inside of our hearts to know the unknown, is we're really asking God, what do you want us to do in these situations? What is truly your will? And how does he do that? Does he give us some type of warm sensation, right? A feeling of peace when we focus our mind's eye on the right decision. Or maybe he gives us a strange sign. I remember a friend when I was in Bible college in New York, he was telling me a story about his friend who was, when he was a kid, he was with his dad. And his dad was backing out of his driveway and seven doves flew off their lawn out of nowhere. And he goes, there it is. There's my sign. That's what God has been trying to show me. And his son's like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you know, doves are God's chosen uh, animal to show you that you're making the right choice. Like Noah sending out the dove, bringing back the olive branch and the dove landing on our savior to show that he was God's son. And seven is God's number of completion. He had all this rationale in like five seconds worked out. And, and, and don't shake your head in dismay at that. We've all done something weird like that in our life where for whatever reason, something strange happens and we go, oh, I think that was a sign from God. We don't follow the logic. Don't think about it. Just go, okay, yeah, I guess this is a sign from God. But is that what we're supposed to look for? Seven doves to fly off our lawn or something like that? Or, or maybe, and this is the real one, we tend to look at God as a magic eight ball. You guys remember those magic eight balls? You ask him a question, you shake him. It's just witchcraft package for kids. And, uh, and, and you shake it. We, we actually keep one of those in the office, and the elders and I, we actually make all the decisions <laughs> off of that. So I <laughs> just... <right. laughs> Uh, you, you know, we, uh, this, the, I came back from two weeks of vacation. I, you know, I, I shook it. Should I preach more for an hour today? Oh, sure. It's up to you. You know, <laughs> I asked if cats are evil. It said no doubt about it. You know, some things you just don't even have to ask about. But uh, if you're a cat lover, I'm just kidding. Um, but truly, that's how we look at God. We look at him as like a magic eight ball. We look at him like a vending machine in the sky, as some people have said, that his sole purpose as our God is to serve our every need. We look at him as a means to an end so often in our lives. But Psalm 25 today, we see the proper way we should view God. We see the proper way that we should view God in the time of waiting and the time of decision-making in our life. This psalm is all about how God guides us. 
Now, one word of perspective that I found really interesting, many of you know by now I just love history. Uh, and, and before we dive into this, up to about 50 or 60 years ago, roughly, there was almost no talk about knowing the will of God for our lives on the level that we're talking today, on personal decision-making. Of course, there was messages on guidance and things like that. But if you look through the sermons of the early church fathers, if you look through the sermons of the Reformation period and, and after, you can scarcely find sermons or topics on personal decision-making, discerning the will of God in those. And at least I couldn't. Maybe you did, but I make it a habit to read many sermons from antiquity because I love old dead guys, because they are not touched by modernity yet that clouds our reading of Scripture. But today, on the flip side of the past, we're obsessed with this subject. This subject of discerning the will of God for our personal lives is one of the most uh, well-attended subject at any conference that offers it as a breakout room or any main speaker that talks on it. It fills up the rooms. And, and it's one of the questions that I get asked the most in my office by you, by people in our church. I have a big decision to make, and I need to know the will of God in this decision. And the reason why I think this is the case, because our culture has changed in the Western world. Our culture has moved to individualism. We're all about ourselves, right? It doesn't, you don't actually have to rewind too far to see that it was more about being tribal, family, orientated group. Like church used to dominate the life. You came to Sunday service, you stayed after and talked, and you came back for evening service. Your life revolved around the community of church. It was about being together, but now... We, it, it's all about being an individual. The second thing I think is because we're all about self-actualization, about my goals, my careers, my skills. I want to prove who I am. And the biggest one of the three is security. We love security as modern, modern people. And we look at the will of God, discerning the will of God, as a way to achieve these three things, to be a better individual, to realize my goals, my career, my, my, my skills, my self-actualization more better, and of course, I want security in all I do. Nobody likes that feeling of being unsecure. So I'm not suggesting that we ignore this subject, not that we blow it off, because the Bible does talk about God's guidance in our lives. But what the Bible does is it puts the emphasis in different places than we do as modern Western thinkers. It puts more emphasis on knowing and trusting God and becoming the kind of person that God wants us to be than it ever does on detecting some mystical guidance and a particular decision. Which brings me to the big idea of our passage in sermon, which is the question of this psalm is not how God guides, right? That's where we get obsessed with how is he guiding me, but it's whom God guides. What is the kind of person that God guides? Because guidance is not as much something God gives you as much as it's something that God does for you. He guides you. The question is, are you the kind of person that God guides? So look at Psalm 25 with me. This psalm is a psalm of David. It's a lament psalm, and it's a prayer for guidance. And this is a great template for how we should pray for God's guidance today as well. And just a little precursor for all you who are regular attenders here, the, the regular diet of our church from the pulpit is expository preaching. We pick books, we work verse by verse through the books, but today I'm going to change it. I know I go away for two weeks, I come back a heretic. Um, you guys, <laughs> it's just crazy. But, but every preaching class you take, they say change it up every once in a while. But anyways, we're still going to do expository preaching, but we're going to look at just a few verses from all the verses we preach, and we're going to pull the thread of God's guidance today from from Psalm 25. So with that, let's start with verse 12, which says, who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the ways that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being and his offspring, offspring sorry, shall inherit the land. So the guidance that David is trusting God for here in the psalm will touch on many different things. There's going to be allusions to many aspects of life that still plague us today, that we still wrestle with today, and that we still also enjoy today. For example, as we look at verse 15, David trusts God to keep him from disaster. He says, as I keep my eyes on him, he's going to keep my foot from getting tripped up in the net. And if any of you have been on a boat, you don't want to get tripped up on the net, right? You're going in the water. Or verse 17, he trusts God to guide him through the things that bring him stress. 
So if, you're, uh, if you believe the lie that God is only concerned about the spiritual stuff, I want you to put that away. I want you to remove that from your mind because what we see David throughout Psalm 25 doing is trusting God's guidance over every inch of his life. And we can do the same. Look at verse 2 with me again. David sums up his hope at the beginning of the psalm and at the end. He says in verse 2, Oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. And then he says in verse 20, he says, Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. So these two verses contain some powerful promises for us who are in Christ. First, we see David in, in these two verses is essentially saying, and this is a really helpful exercise for you who are studying the Bible, find those promises and then rework them into your language, okay? Stay true to the word of God, but bring them into a language that you use. So that's what I did for this. Promise one is others, um, uh, oops, sorry, others cannot mess up God's will for me. That's what I, I see him saying in verses 2 and in 20. Others cannot mess up God's will for my life. All throughout this psalm, David talks about his enemies who are rising against him, who are ruining his life. And, and we saw this when we read the psalm, and he even says in verse 19, consider how many are my foes. Look at all my foes. And with the violent hatred, they hate me. They're not just opposed to him, they hate him. And some of you might look back on your past and you might see somebody who's just really messed up your life. People are crazy, aren't they? They just really messed up your life. Maybe it was a brother. Maybe it was a mother, an ex-spouse, a father, a business partner. You can fill in the blank. You know your story. David had those people too in his life. And in light of all those enemies that were rising against him, David in verse 2 and in verse 20 is basically saying, I trust you, O God, that your promises for my life are more powerful than all the evil intentions that are coming against me. Do you believe that? That God is more powerful than those who rage against you? And when you read this promise in verse 2 of not being put to shame by enemies, it's hard not to think, when I was studying, to think of the story of Joseph in Genesis. Joseph, right, had some very nasty brothers who messed up his life in some great ways. They sold him into slavery, and then they faked his death, and he was gone. And Joseph suffered because of this. He was removed from his loving home. But God used those things in his life in a way of fulfilling Joseph's destiny. What? The bad things? Yes. That was all part of God's plan. And when it all finally came to a head, this is how Joseph summarized it in front of his brothers. He says, all those things you did to me, yeah, those things like selling me into slavery, let's just address the elephant in the room, that's a big one. Yeah, it hurt me. Sure, it kept me up at night. Yeah, I was in prison for some things I didn't do. But all those things, I'm paraphrasing, all those things... You did to me those evil intentions. You meant them for evil, he says. But God meant them for good. And that's the difference. God meant them for good. And this understanding of God's sovereignty enabled Joseph to forgive his brothers. It didn't relieve them from the responsibilities or their actions. Just Joseph realized that God had a greater plan at play. He was able to let go of the bitterness and, he, and that comes with thinking that someone else has ruined your life. Because belief in the sovereignty of God, and sovereignty, it just means God's in control, just a fun little word. Belief in the sovereignty of God and his promises to work all things out for good enables you as an individual to forgive others. Yeah. I know that some of you may be trapped in a cycle of bitterness in your life because you can't shake how somebody else has seemingly ruined your life. So here's my challenge for you. And I want you to take this serious. This isn't just sermon filler fluff. This is a real challenge. I want you to go home later today, and I want you to grab a, a, an index card, if you have one, or whatever piece of paper, and I want you to write the name of the individual who hurt you on it. And then under that name, I want you to write, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And then I want you to commit to praying for the next seven days until next Sunday, praying that prayer over that situation. 
praying that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I can promise you that you will begin to feel the bitterness melt in your life. I'm not saying you'll be gone in seven days. Don't, don't quote me wrong. You might still be bitter in seven days, but you'll begin to feel it release from you, to melt from you, and then commit to praying that prayer as long as it takes. Amen? Okay, on to the second promise we see. My own past mistakes don't permanently disqualify me from God's will either. We see this in most of David's psalms. He was a man who was after God's own heart. And this is what set him apart from King Saul, who was before him, right? If you look at what King Saul did and what David did, David did some pretty messed up stuff compared to Saul. But you know what the difference was, was David loved God and Saul didn't. David loved, or sorry, Saul loved himself. Saul was a prideful man, the Bible says. But David was a humble man that loved God, did some atrocious things. But his heart was going and moving towards God and not away from him like Saul because he knew how to repent. And he repented, for the most part, quickly. Verse 11 shows us this repentance. It says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. My guilt is great. What does that show us there? It shows us that David is feeling the conviction of his sin. He's feeling the weight of his sin on his life. It's not just a little bit of guilt. It's not just a little bit of iniquity. It was big league iniquity. He was feeling it. But David does something that we often as Christians neglect to do. He went to God in his guilt. What do we tend to do? We sin and then we run from God for whatever reason. Oh, I'll pray for him in two days. Then he'll be happy with me again. Maybe he'll forget. Somebody else will sin worse than me. And we run from God. But, but David didn't hide from God in his guilt. He ran to God. And he prayed to God for his guidance and perfect plan for his life. Because he's going, hey, how I'm living right now is clearly not in line with God's plan. I need you, oh God, to correct course. I need you to change me. Because here's what we need to see. David believes God's promises are greater even than his own mistakes. Do you believe that? And some of you hear that and you say, I get, I get that. God will protect me from others. I understand that. But are you sure he'll protect me from my own mistakes? Like, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the things I've thought. You don't know the things that I've said or have done to others. To me, it feels more like God's just going to say, sorry, kiddo, you got yourself into this situation. You can get yourself out. Right? We often view God like our own parents. And on the other hand, it's true. Sin does bring about, and mistakes bring about, major consequences in your life. And they can be painful, but those things don't disqualify you from God's ultimate plan in your life. Romans, read Romans 5, 6, and 7, right to 8, right? He ends 5 going, talking about the grace of God, no matter how much sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And he's making this great case for grace, and he starts off chapter 6 going, well, shall we sin to get more grace? (laughs) No! Don't do that. But he's saying, no matter how far gone you've went, God's grace is still there. It's still there. Look at Jacob, for example. Jacob and Esau. Jacob was a crafty individual. He, did a, he sinned against his brother horribly by stealing his birthright, by tricking him and other things like that. And he, was, he, he ran from his family because obviously Esau's mad at him and wants to hurt him. And on the run, he meets this girl named Rachel. And Rachel and him fall in love. She becomes the love of his life. And then you fast forward a few years, a few lot of years, and guess who comes from that line? Jesus. Jesus comes from the line of Rachel and Jacob. Was that plan B? Did did Jesus come from the wrong plan? Of course not. Does that also mean that it was good that Jacob sinned? No. No. Not at all. That sin affected Jacob for the rest of his life. Yet despite his failure, hear this, despite his failure, despite his sin, the Messiah still came from his line. You know what the church has done horribly? We're we're getting better at it. But babies who are born out of wedlock, we've treated the baby like they are an outcast because of the sin of their parents. And if you were born out of wedlock, I want you to hear this. That didn't ruin God's plan for your life. You are still in God's will and plan. Your sins of your parents don't count as your own. Look at Jacob and and, and Rachel. The Messiah came from a, a line that's filled and riddled with mistakes. But Jesus came out perfect. 
If you're willing to trust God, all of us, if we're willing to trust God, even your past sins can't disqualify you from God's ultimate destiny for you. Even your past sins can't disqualify you. If you trust God, we will repent. In fact, an amazing picture of God's grace is that even through your sins, God brings about his plans. I know you think you're the center of the universe, but you're not. Okay, sorry to burst your bubble. God is. And you're not strong enough, you're not big enough to ruin his plan for your life. You can't do it. God is bigger. If you were big enough to ruin God's plan, guess what? He wouldn't be God. He is greater. He is transcendent, and we are not. Look at verse 10. It says, All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. What we're seeing here is faithful, consistent love. Remember when I taught about a few weeks ago on the steadfast love of God, the hased. It's connected to the very fiber of who God is, that he is committed to you as a people in Christ Jesus. It's all faithful, consistent love to those who are in Christ. He doesn't give up on you when you give up on him. Just because you fall off the path doesn't mean he abandons you. He doesn't kick you out of the family just because you messed up too much. So a question you might be asking is, what do I have to do to experience then this type of guidance in my life? Remember, the question is in this psalm is not how God guides, but whom does God guide? So what kind of person receives the guidance of God? And what we see throughout Psalm 25 is that there are four characteristics that make up this type of of person. And the first one is that they are trained in the ways of God. It says in verse 4, it says, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. What David is talking about here is about an inward familiarity with the ways of God and, and, and that it trains him in how to act. Think of it kind of like an athlete. An athlete can't be instructed on every, uh, every response, every scenario on the ice or on the field. It's impossible to know how other teams are going to play in every situation. But what you can train an athlete to do is how to read situation and give skills to respond accordingly. I love this quote by Michael Jordan. He was asked by a reporter once. He, they said, you know, when you jump in the air, do you know what you're going to do? He says, no, I just jump and then I decide. And I just really like that. He, he doesn't know. He just knows he's going to get it into that hoop somehow. And he just jumps and he decides in the air. I love that because that's such a, a picture of sometimes how we follow the will of God. We do everything we can do that we know to do. And then we just make that decision and hope for the best, right? That God will guide us. Here's how the New Testament talks about this. It's probably a little bit more authoritative than Michael Jordan. So it says in, in, in Hebrews 5 verse 13, it says, For everyone who lives on milk, is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What that refers to there in the book of Hebrews is things in our lives that are not outlined in Scripture. Really, the scripture is very clear on many ways how we should live. But I have yet to find a book that says, hey, yeah, you should buy that house. Yeah, 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 you should take that job. No, you should have more kids or whatever. Right. There, it's not that specific to your life. But it gives you principles and things in the Bible that help you think through those decisions in a godly manner. Being trained in scripture can give you instincts to know what God wants in your life. And then it says constant practice. And this means that you're being so saturated in scripture and skill and application that it becomes second nature. I like to say if someone were to cut you, you would bleed the Bible. That's what Spurgeon said about John Bunyan who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. He said you could prick John Bunyan with a needle anywhere on his body and he would bleed the Bible. And what he was meaning by that is that he was so well versed in the things of God, he knew his scripture and it was second nature to him. When he was squeezed, scripture would come out of him. 
He was in constant practice with it. It didn't just come naturally. He didn't just wake up and he wasn't just like that. It came with constant practice. And sorry, we should commit to doing that as well. It's like this. For whatever reason, I was talked into playing on a baseball team this past summer. I played a few games. I couldn't make them all. Uh, uh, but I quickly learned that I am more built to read books than play sports. <laughs> God, that's just how it is. And in my mind, though, knew what to do in those situations in the game. I was an umpire for many years as a teen, so I knew how to play baseball. I knew the ins and outs of baseball. My mind knew what to do, but my body didn't. I looked more, I didn't look anything like a graceful athlete. I looked more like a wounded duck coming in for a crash landing on the, like, they started just putting me to the right all the time. I don't know why. Maybe no balls go over there. It was just horrible. But why is that? Because I wasn't in constant practice of playing. I knew what to do. I knew the rules. I knew how to, how, how, what they expected. And I just kind of hoped my body would catch up. It would just come naturally to me. So here's my action step for you. You need to get so saturated. You and I need to get so saturated in God's word. We need to know his ways. We need to begin to think in the patterns of scripture, but it can't stay there. It has to move to action. Because you won't live out the will of God any more than you know the word of God. But you can know the word of God and not live out the will of God. I know many Christians who love theology, but they're cold and they're angry. And they're hurtful. We must put our theology into action. I always say this from this pulpit. Our theology must move to doxology. It must move to worship and practice in our lives. So the first characteristic is being trained in God's ways. The second uh, is the person who is guided by God is those who are obedient to his command, to the commands of God. Look at verses 9 to 10. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble in, in all his ways. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimony. So we read the word humble there, and the word humble means that we believe that God's ways are best. They're better than my ways, and the opposite to that is pride, where you assume that your ways are better than God's ways. And David is saying, God's promise to give, God promises to give guidance in the areas of life that scripture don't address, those things that we kind of detailed. He he says, I promise to extend this guidance to those who are obeying him in the areas that scripture does does address. Like I said, scripture is very clear on how we should live our lives as Christians. And we need to be obedient in what we know to be obedient in. When you disobey and proudly assume that your ways are better, you cut yourself off from the guidance of God. When I picture this, like if I was God, and it's a good thing I'm not, you guys should be very thankful. Like you're praying for guidance over here, but you're being disobedient over here. Like, this doesn't, com- uh, it's not compatible. And so some of you might not right now be saying, God, what is your will in this decision? Eh, 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 eh. But you have some areas of disobedience in your life that are hidden that you refuse to resolve. And God is pointing you back to that. Go deal with that stuff. Let's work on that stuff. Let me into that stuff. I want to help you and heal you in that stuff. And that's what he's guiding you to, but you're looking to something else. Or maybe your obedience feels like, like it's often leading you into more difficulty. Oftentimes, I don't know where we've coined this, that we think that, hey, if it's easy, it's God's will, and if it's hard, it's not. It's, 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 it's very much the other way around most of the time throughout our lives. A lot of times, our obedience does lead us into more difficulties. You know, maybe you're saying, God, why am I not married by now? And you, and you just keep following God's thread, and it seems to leading you to places like Drumheller where nobody is here my, my, my speed. No, okay, but it keeps taking you to f- dark forests and, and, and caves, and you're like, where are all the men? Where are all the women, God? I want to get married. It seems like you just keep moving me away from marriage, and you're tempted to compromise. You're tempted to pick someone maybe who's not God's choice for you. Or maybe you're tempted to move into immorality. I won't detail that because there's kids in the room, but you know what I'm talking about. To experience the guidance of God, you have to follow his leading. Or maybe you're concerned about your business. You're a business leader here. 
and you're, you're not doing as well as you thought you would, so you're, you're, you're tempted to cut some corners and, and to get ahead a little bit. Or maybe you're, you've done something uh, inappropriate in your workplace and you're afraid to tell your boss, so you're tempted to lie. And ultimately, what this comes down to is, who are you trusting your life with? Who are you trusting your future with? Waiting on God means doing things his way and trusting him to exalt you in his time. Disobedience means that you take matters into your own hands. And I do this way too often in my life. I like to play the God card. I like, to, I like control. And I know a lot of you do too. It's just a human thing. But what that always leads to is disgrace. That's what verse 3 tells us. It says, no one who waits for you will be disgraced. He's talking about to God. And those who act treacherously without cause will be disgraced. They will be. Or maybe this one hits a little closer home. This is my last analogy. Maybe you have someone in your past to whom you refuse to extend forgiveness to, even though you know you should. And that keep, that's keeping you from experiencing the blessing of God in the present. Extending forgiveness to those who have hurt us I say this often, I think it's one of the hardest things we're called to do as Christians. I really do. It's, it's the hardest thing we're called to do. And, but church history, both old and recent, is filled with stories of men and women who have moved through forgiveness towards people who have hurt them in unimaginable ways, and it's a supernatural thing. We must be obedient to the words of God. And the second char- that's the second characteristic, and the third is those trusting in the promises of God. Look at verse 3 again. It says, No one who waits for you will be disgraced, and those who act treacherously without cause will be disgraced. And then verse 14 says, The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. And friendship there means that nothing will be withheld from you. You're friends with him. It can also be translated, which I think is a better translation in the Christian Standard Bible. It says, The secret counsel. The secret counsel is given to those who fear the Lord. His guidance, his wisdom, nothing will be withheld from you. Tim Keller says on that verse that this phrase indicates those special moments of spirit guidance in your life that he wants to give to you. And there are multiple ways God can guide you in those ways. I think there's three main ones, and this is a 30,000-foot perspective. I will not go deep down on this. But the first one and the main one is the council of the church. Oh, I didn't put them on here. Uh, The council of the church. A lot of times in the Bible uh, and throughout the New Testament, the special spirit guidance comes from the church itself. In fact, this is the number one way you probably read about it. Acts uh, verse 15, or sorry, chapter 15, verse 28 is your key in this. The Holy Spirit said to the church, right, to separate Paul and Barnabas for a work that I have for them. But what's interesting when you read that, the Spirit has something for Paul and Barnabas, but he doesn't tell them. He tells it to who? He tells it to the church. And the church tells it to Barnabas and Paul. I've had in my life lots of people in church who give me instruction just like this. They come up to me, they go, hey, you know, I've been praying for you about X, Y, and Z, and this is what I feel like uh, you should do. You know, here's just, you know, take it how you will, whatever. And oftentimes that works out to be very good counsel that I've followed, and I believe that it was spirit-guided. And, and I don't, uh, so that's why I say it's a main uh, truth about the church. If you cut yourself off from the fellowship of the church, you are cutting yourself off from the opportunity to be guided by the Spirit. You are. And I don't just mean coming here and sitting and listening to me preach every Sunday. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that you're involved in the life of the church, that you're growing in relationship with others in the church, that you have everything in common with people, that you're growing in community and small groups and loving each other and then spreading that love out into our community. And then another way is the arrangement of circumstances. Uh, We see this also in Acts. The book of Acts, we see Paul saying many things like, hey, I thought I was supposed to go over here, but the Holy Spirit barred me from going over there, so now I'm going over here. And so it was just a, a way how things were arranged throughout his life. And then the third way is inner promptings in prayer. We see this throughout the Bible. One of my favorite ways, we were, uh, Dean and I were talking about this guy earlier today, about Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was prompted to build the wall. He, Nehemiah knew that God wanted him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But what's interesting, if you read the book of Nehemiah, never once does it say anywhere that God told him to do this. 
All it says is in chapter 2, verse 12, is that the Spirit of God put this on my heart. That's what he says. He gave me a burden to rebuild this wall. And I knew this burden was from him, a desire, a passion. And some of you will experience that same burden. You'll, you'll feel a burden for a mission. You'll feel a burden for the church, for a ministry, for a person, for a people group. And God will press that upon your heart. And he will use you mightily in that way. That's why I, I don't like coming up with ideas for ministry. I like ministries coming from the floor. Because that means it's been burdened on your heart. And then I don't have to convince you to lead it. You already want to. So when these are necessary in your life, they are given to the person who trusts in God and walks in his way. And I know what you might be thinking, like, is he done preaching yet? No, I'm almost done. But, uh, but you might be thinking like, okay, pastor, I'm, I'm tracking with you. I need to be trained in God's ways. I need to be obedient to his commands. I need to be open to a special counsel from his people. I get all that. But what does this look like practically? What does this mean when, I, when I'm facing life-changing decisions in my life? And that's a good question. And the answer to that is actually really simple. There's nothing mystical about it. And that might be a little disappointing to you, but it's very simple. What you do is you take advantage of every means of wisdom you have at your disposal, things like the scripture, your own reason that God has given you, your counsel from trusted men and women in your lives. Of course, prayer, that should really be the first one. Prayer, praying and, and searching uh, God and, 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 and discerning his will. Uh, so when you do all those things, then what you do is you just commit to making the decision. Okay, I've, I've prayed about it, I've, 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 I've consulted your word, I've consulted my trusted uh, sources in my life. Okay, I'm going to make this decision. I still don't know for sure, but I'm trusting God that you will guide me just like you promised I would. I really like this little phrase tucked away in Acts 15 that gives us a glimpse of how the apostles made decisions. In verse 28, it says, oh, it's right there. It says, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to not lay a greater burden or requirements on you. I just love that. It seemed good. They were trusting God after prayer, after discussion and counseling each other. They decided that this was the will of God. They didn't just say, thus says the Lord. They say, hey, this seems good to both the Lord and to us. So this is what you're going to do. And I just love that because it gives us a picture on how we make decisions as well. And you might counter that and say, well, what if I do all that? And I still make the wrong decision. Again, a simple answer to that. Nothing mystical, maybe not satisfying, but it's the truth. You just own it. You trust God to guide you through it, that he will work it out. The burden, hear this, is not for you to figure it out. God says, put that burden of figuring it out on me. I can guide you even when you're not a good listener. I can Here's one of my favorite verses on this. It's pretty much a life verse. It's Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Trust in God's ability, church, to show you. Not in your ability to figure it out. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Verse 6 has two phrases in it. One is yours and one is God's. Yours is all your ways. You're going to acknowledge him. You're going to obey what you know to obey from scripture. And you're going to seek the wisdom that is at your disposal. And what's God's promise? He's going to guide you. He's going to direct your path. He's going to make them straight. Which means that in any decision, after you've done everything that God has told you to do, you just make the decision. And you thank God. Hey, this is not on me to figure out how this is all going to work out. It's on you. I'm doing everything you told me to do, and now I'm trusting that you have promised to direct my path, and I'm trusting in you to do what you said you would do, even if it all goes wrong. Again, I want to remind you of the big idea. The question in the psalm is not how God is guiding you. That's where we get obsessed and hung up on, but it's who is God guiding. So what you must do as a Christian is making sure that your life is in line with the way that God has laid out in his word, and then trusting that he will guide you into all truth. Because guidance in the Bible is not as much as something that God gives you, but it's as much as something that God does for you. You become the kind of person that God wants you to be, and you trust him with the rest. Don't think of God's guidance as getting a map, that he will show you the way. Rather, God is a guide through your life, and he offers something better than just a map. He offers you a relationship with the guide. One of my inspirations of the faith is Elizabeth Elliot. 
And in her book, uh, Slow and Certain Light, she tells a story of two, a couple of American explorers who have come to the Amazon jungle. And the American uh, explorers, they said, hey, draw us a map. We want, we want to know where to go. And she says, you don't need a map, you need a guide. And they said, in a typical American way, no, we don't. We can do this, right? <laughs> she says in her book, she never saw them again. Now, she does admit, she doesn't know if they made it or not, but she never saw them again. The point is, maps are helpful, but when you're driving down a crazy highway, there's cars all around you, and you ask your wife, hey, is that our exit? And she goes, oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> maps are not helpful, right? So when you're going through the frustrating day-to-day -day of life, when, when, when things are just bogging you down like they always do, you don't need a map. You need a relationship with a God that is so constant that he doesn't just show you where to go, but he leads you where he wants you to go. That's Psalm 25. And very quickly, the last characteristic is of the person that God guides is those depending on the grace of God. Several times throughout this psalm, David talks about God's rescue of him. He talks about God's forgiveness and deliverance. And in verse 10, he exalts, he says, All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimony. This is God's unfailing faithfulness to his people. But what haunts many of us humans in our pursuit of God's will is that we, tr we believe this lie that God has mixed feelings towards us. Maybe God is still holding some grudges against us. Maybe God, like my earthly father, has some disappointments about me. Maybe that's what we're projecting onto God. Maybe God has regretted saving me. So when any good blessing that comes your way, you're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Because we assume God is saying to us, now you know you really don't deserve this. You know what you've done. You don't really deserve to be happy. So when any of the good you're always waiting for the bad. But friends, how God guides you, I'm going to preach this every Sunday till I'm never your, until I die or I'm not your pastor anymore, okay? God guides you, how he guides you, and what he gives to you is no longer based on the worthiness of how you've lived. But it's on the worthiness of how Jesus lived. And Jesus lived perfectly. You can't. All the Lord's ways show faithful love and truth. All the wrath of God was poured out on his son, Jesus. The New Testament way of saying this in Romans 8, 1 is that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're here hearing my voice and you are in Christ, there is now therefore no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. If you are outside of Christ, it's condemnation all day long. But inside of Christ, it's gone. That means you don't need to wait for the other shoe to drop. It's already dropped on Jesus. I love this verse in Proverbs 10. It says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. In the gospel, I can embrace, you can embrace the promise to walk in all blessings all the days of your life. In Christ, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. And the promises of God are always yes and amen towards you in Jesus. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father who is above, the Father of lights whom there is no shadow of turning. What does that mean? It means he's never going to change his mind about you. He's never going to go up and go, come on, Aaron, I've already, t I've already forgiven you of that sin. Stop being an idiot. Oh, there's kids. Sorry. Stop messing up. I regret you. You're out of the family. He doesn't change his mind about you. There's no mixed feelings. Or to quote David once more, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And that is how we go through life with confidence in God's guidance. That first, we, we focus our eyes on Jesus we keep our eyes transfixed, that we know that our life is bound by what Christ did on the cross. Our salvation is secure. We no longer can earn more love from God, more acceptance from God, because we are already 100% accepted by God in Christ. You are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. He has taken your sin. He has exchanged it with his righteousness. He lived the life you couldn't. He died the death, meaning you should have, and he rose again so we could be saved. And that when we have the confidence in that, then we go, okay, I don't have a license to sin because Romans 6 tells me that. But what it does tell me is that when I mess up, I'm not big enough to blow God's plan for my life. <coughs> and when you come against me or if I come against you, we are not big enough to deter God's will from your life either. Trust in the Lord, amen?
and he will lead and guide you in all things. He will make your path straight. Let's pray as the worship team comes. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you, God, for Psalm 25. Father, although we didn't look at all the verses there, God, we looked at the theme of guidance that David was praying for. And Lord, that's what we need in our life. Father, that we wouldn't get so obsessed with how you're guiding us and the way you're guiding us, but Lord, that we would be more concerned with that we are people that you are guiding. Father, that we are keeping our eyes on you. Father, that we're being trained in your words and putting it into action, O oh Lord. Father, that we're trusting in you, O oh Lord, to work all things out, even the bad things in our lives. And Father, even if being obedient to you brings us into more pain, into more hardship, O oh God, give us the strength to keep going keeping our eyes fixed on you as Romans 10, 11, and 12 all talk about, O oh God, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.